Okay, so in Farkson summary, since we ran out of a little bit of time at the end of the last class, we talked about the um, infarction proper being assessed through observing negative Q waves, the um, electrical activity moving away from the electrode. But you can observe the lead up to infarction. Remember, infarction was um, dead tissue, heart attack, rupture of cardiac myocytes, which is where we don't want to be. We want to avoid that. We can observe the lead up to infarction by trying to understand ischemia. So ischemia is lack of proper oxygen supply to the tissue that often will precede infarction. So if, if we can observe ischemia or if angina or chest pain uh, can point us towards ischemia, then we might be able to refer someone for clinical treatment right away or get an echocardiogram to better assess the situation. And when looking at ischemia, we focused on the ST segment. So between ventricular depolarization and repolarization. Now, why we looked at the ST segment was that in a situation where oxygen was lacking, it was difficult for those cells to make enough ATP. And so it was hard to restore the normal situation. And so the ST segment is a representation of that restoration, returning to a, a non-depolarized, a non-contracted state. And if the uh, ST segment, which is normally flat, was depressed, that indicates an exertional angina or chest pain, an exertional ischemia. You'd often see this during a graded exercise test. If it was elevated, you can observe that at rest, and it indicates something to do with uh, a blockage in the coronary arteries. Supply ischemia. Not enough blood is being delivered to the tissue. Now, those can develop over time prior to seeing Q-wave pathology. Prior to seeing the large negative Q wave that indicates there was an infarction, there's damage, irreparable damage. How it progresses is if we see an elevated ST segment, note most of these are elevated because this is typically observed at rest with supply uh, ischemia. If the ST segment is elevated and there's no apparent Q wave, that might mean there's ongoing delivery problems. There might be the makings of an infarction happening right now. If the ST segment is elevated and we start to see Q waves, the, the, the negative deflection in Q waves gets larger as the infarction proceeds and tissue uh, dies. That indicates somewhere on the order of a day to a week, there are supply problems in the, uh, the near, uh, more recent past. And then as that gets older and resolves itself, ST segment actually becomes depressed. And a key difference between this and the exertional angina is there's an inverted T wave. Normally, a T wave is an upwards deflection. Repolarization of the ventricles is an upwards deflection. But something to do with the ischemia and infarction registers repolarization as a downwards deflection if infarction is um, or has occurred. Typically this is uh, long into recovery, a week to six months. It's clearly evident. You can see the progression on the last slide uh, that we looked at last class. These all indicate ischemia or lack of supply. If there is damage due to lack of supply, that's infarction, cardiac myocyte death, and we determine that by the absence of of depolarization. Remember that tissue can't be electrically stimulated. That tissue can't contract. Good morning. That tissue won't contribute to the cardiac cycle or the pumping of blood. So it's a hole. It's a vacant space in the heart where we're not registering any activity or contraction. We can register the activity around it and behind it and that's why the activity moving away from the electrode is what we observe a negative deflection, uh, the signal moving away from the electrode. So as far as infarction goes, this is what I want to summarize. Now I want to briefly bring up a couple points on each of the elements. 
Recall the elements that we talked about in this section uh, were rate, really easy to, to uh, evaluate rate according to any ECG, 12 lead uh, notwithstanding. Rhythm, we need a 12 lead to really uh, assess rhythm properly. Axis and hypertrophy, axis and rotation and hypertrophy. We get a lot of information on those from the 12 lead and infarction we just talked about. So, what main salient points sh should you remember about each? 300 rule. 300 rule. After the setup of a 12 lead ECG. You, we've done this to death, so I'm not surprised that I forgot this point in the summary. We talked about the, uh, the limb leads, six limb leads in the, in the frontal plane, six chest leads in the horizontal plane. You know how we create all those vectors and that wheel that I put up uh, a number of times that gives you a full 360 degree picture of electrical activity in the heart. For rate, what I was referring to uh, just a moment ago, the 300 rule. Just remember this order, count the number of large um, separations or large grid lines on your ECG trace, and you can ballpark heart rate in a matter of two to three seconds. Very, very easy. <coughs> Rhythm, which we talked about a little bit at the start of class, we talked about it in more detail than I'm putting up here because there is so much detail that it's hard to filter out what, um, what to call out, but focus on the regularity. Is the rhythm consistent? Is there always a P wave for a given QRS complex? Do they always line up? Does one precede the other or does that relationship change? So look for regularity and how the characteristics of an ECG trace are set up. And that is the, um, the best general description I can give you to a starting point for evaluating what different um, arrhythmias we've looked at in class. Last week we looked at uh, determining the axis and rotation. Remember for each of those the key so determining the angle of the axis of the heart and the rotation of the heart was the isoelectric vector. Those are the vectors where the electrical activity is balanced, top and bottom. And what that means is there's no, there's as much uh, signal heading towards the electrode as away from the electrode which by process of elimination means that the vector must be perpendicular. So the isoelectric uh, chest lead that you observe on your ECG trace is that which is perpendicular to the net vector of the heart. It's balanced uh, top and bottom. Hypertrophy, we mainly focused on the ventricles because those are the locations where hypertrophy is most obvious, but you can also register atrial hypertrophy. Remember biphasic P waves? You can register atrial hypertrophy, but often the ventricles are the, the parts of the heart that are taxed and that enlarge in response to that, um, that training, for lack of a better word. And we normally observe QRS progression through the chest leads, which represents ventricular depolarization. It should be weighted towards the left side. The left side is naturally bigger. There's more pressure to overcome. But in a situation where we observe right side or left side hypertrophy, that changes. And lastly, we talked about this just uh, this morning for an infarction. Damage to tissues is indicated by large negative Q waves ischemia potentially leading to damage of tissues by progression of the ST segment over time. I want to be able to leave that behind us. If there are any pressing questions, I will take them now. Otherwise, we will get into some fun material for the last class before the midterm. Yeah, go ahead. How can we, like, differentiate between Okay, so so how can you differentiate between ventricular hypertrophy, specifically I think left side, or it doesn't matter really, and um, a delay at the AV node. So remember when the signal passing through the heart was slowed down or passing through the ventricles was slowed down, 
the QRS complex was elongated. That is, it took more time for the signal to pass through the ventricles. You should be able to observe that stretching in any lead. You're just looking at the depolarization in um, a slightly different slice through the heart, but that doesn't change how long it takes for the signal to propagate. So any lead will be able to identify the elongation of the QRS complex. Where that differs from hypertrophy is we're really comparing the progression across the chest lead. So we're not looking at only one uh, trace with one QRS complex. We're looking at how it changes in V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6. And it's the relationship between those. And uh, I gave you a couple of measurements that you can make to help uh, qualify it. But it's the relationship that really points to hypertrophy. So taking many leads into account for hypertrophy, any singular lead should show you a wide QRS complex if there's a delay in propagating the signal. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. That helped you all as well? Okay. So I'm going to call it there for now on this section. Class is still, uh, still ongoing. But if you have questions as we get through the material, or as we lead up to the midterm, which is Thursday, in class, 8.15. Don't be late. <clears throat> you can be late if you want to. You'll have less time to write the midterm. That's fine. If you have questions, I have office hours, of course, tomorrow. And feel free to email, reach out, and we can set up a time outside of office hours to talk about any specifics. Yeah? You have the whole class. Yeah, 75 minutes. I really want it to be, but let's wait and see what happens as we get through class today. Okay. It is it is a little demanding of me to ask you to learn something new two days before the midterm. With the break, <laughs> I know you all agree, with the break uh, next week, the midterm has been pushed up a little bit, so normally we have the full week to go through this and then time to digest it so that it can be included on the midterm. I want it to be. I'm open to discussion. Let's discuss. Because, because this is why. Because whether you believe it or not, whether you believe it or not, I'm doing you a favor by doing it before the break. You are probably, no matter how much I, I have faith that you will sit down and read all the material and study the entire time, you're probably not going to do it as rigorously as you would like. Maybe you have other plans. I'm not sure. Your reading week is easily distractible and variable, so I'm doing it beforehand because we're in the mindset right now of learning, producing, writing exams, going to lab, and then you don't have to do it later. It's off your plate, so we're doing it before. It's not changing. It's not changing. You just gave me. <laughs> okay, you're right. If we're, we're doing it before. <laughs> because you're in that mindset, we're not changing the midterm date. Um, what I might do is not include this on the midterm. Let's see how this goes. We are talking about energy expenditure. This is the lead up to the substrate use lab. More specifically, we're talking about obesity and diabetes. So energy expenditure and modifying energy expenditure is our tactic, our strategy for treating obesity and diabetes. So. Energy expenditure, you'll see it in lab and we can modify it. We can calculate gram amounts of fat and carbs used in a given exercise bout and we can manipulate this extensively. But it is a tool in our toolkit for treating obesity and diabetes. So in uh, this section, over two classes today and then it's going to be two weeks from now, we're going to talk about the scope of obesity and diabetes in Canada, and I'll drill down into Andy Ganesh proper. We can look at our local rates again. We are going to discuss the idea of energy balance, energy in and or energy out. How do we measure each? Can we measure each accurately? And what does it mean to be imbalanced or not imbalanced? We'll introduce the ideas of O2 debt and excess 
post-exercise oxygen consumption. This is elevated metabolism in recovery from exercise. It's a residual effect of exercise. And so we can often use this, depending on the type of exercise we're using, to boost the effects of a given exercise club. We'll use those concepts to describe energy imbalance. So what I want to create at the end is an energy imbalance. I'm hoping to, uh, to spin a story or convince you that energy imbalance is worth creating through all of these uh, ingredients. So we want to do this ultimately so that we can counter the rising trends of uh, overweight and obese individuals, children, adults alike, and the prevalence of diabetes in in modern culture. Lastly, what is kind of new and an, an interesting spin on the material, we'll look at some quote unquote cures for diabetes, which if you remember back the very first week, we talked about modern chronic disease being incurable, non-communicable, it's a spectrum, it's a lifestyle and genetic uh, hodgepodge, it's difficult to understand, there's not one cause and effect. There are some promising, convincing therapies that work to quote unquote cure diabetes. Now because of the way that the, uh, the break and our mid are set up, we're actually going to Tarantino this, uh, this section. We're going to move after the scope information, we're jumping down to the physiology and cures before we do the energy balance and um, epoch stuff. That is because when we come back after the break on Tuesday, you will be doing the energy expenditure lab that week. So I want that information fresh in your minds. This is that information. And if I'm going to ask you a question on the midterm, it will be related to the workings of obesity and diabetes. If, we'll asterisk it, we'll leave it for discussion at the end of class. Also, this is really cool, so I want to talk about it now. Question? Yes, we are talking about type 2 diabetes, uh, non-insulin dependent diabetes. It's not a, a malfunction of the pancreas to produce insulin, which is type 1 diabetes, which is largely a genetic, um, a genetic disorder. Type 2 diabetes is potential, potentially, and you can make an argument for somewhat genetically related, but largely a, a deficit of lifestyle. Interestingly, my dad has type 1 diabetes and was just in this experimental surgery in Edmonton where he had pancreatic islets transplanted. He had stem cells taken out and then they grew pancreatic islets and then either infused them or somehow implanted them surgically so that now at what is he, 60 years old, he's finally producing some insulin natively in his body for the first time since he was 30. Conveniently, he developed type 1 diabetes when he was 30 when I was born. And so I always get the, uh, I'm the scapegoat that the added stress of having a, a newborn was what really triggered that, that uh, uh, whatever the, the stress is that, uh, that triggered type 1 diabetes for him. I say, that's fine. Um, I won't take that too personally. But now after years of taking insulin shots and monitoring his blood glucose, and then also having a pretty poor diet on top of it and developing type 2 on top of type 1 despite all of my advice. He's finally pulling back and producing his own insulin. I think um, he's down to maybe one or two units a day if not off of insulin, which is really exciting. That's not in the diabetes cure section because we are talking about type 2 to circle all the way back to that. So doom and gloom. Obesity and diabetes, of course, it's on the rise. This is a, a ranking of some major countries, according to McLean's, that have high incidence rates of obesity, um, population adjusted percents. We have a comparison of Canada versus America. This is just North America minus Mexico. The darker staining uh, areas are a higher percentage of obesity rates. The uh, lighter staining areas have a lower percentage of obesity obese population. So in general, we seem to be doing better than the states, which is great, but we're not doing so great in our own right. If you look towards the East Coast, where we are currently, there's a fair bit of dark staining fill, and so we'll explore that in a bit more detail 
uh, moving forward. But we're in the one quarter to a third of the population range that is considered uh, overweight or has a body mass index over 30. Now this isn't the, the best measure for qualifying obesity and it's McLean's. So we're gonna look at some statistics from reliable sources to evaluate how bad the picture really is. Now, as far as the scope of obesity goes, it is non-discriminate. It can begin in childhood, it can begin in adulthood. Most of the occurrences occur in adulthood because it's really the adults in our, in our recent past that have had access, free and easy access to convenience, high fat laden foods, um, cushy lifestyles that don't need a high degree of physical activity. And so many, um, many occurrences were in adults until recently. Now that children are being introduced to the equation, I think one in three kids these days is considered obese and that's on the rise, which is really not encouraging. And I briefly alluded to this at the start of lecture, there isn't one answer. So I'm focusing on diabetes ultimately in this section. And I'm using obesity uh, and being overweight because the majority of our observations support that it is a precursor or it contributes to diabetes. It doesn't rule out that type 2 diabetes can manifest without obesity or that being obese doesn't necessarily mean you'll become type 2 diabetic, but the large majority of our observations agree that those two things tend to go together. And it's difficult to understand. I'm going to present a couple theories that um, do a really good job of setting up cause and effect in a stepwise manner for how the accumulation of energy leads to diabetes, but there are a number of cultural, societal values, lifestyle uh, elements, personal hormonal things that will contribute to the ultimate picture. And so there's more to this even though I'm approaching it from a very kind of um, ground up physical building block point of view. And it's worth, it's worth treating not only for our personal quality of life, without diabetes and obesity, people are generally healthier, but because of the societal costs associated with it as well. And this is outside of the scope of our course, but the costs for treatment are large. The, uh, the costs for treatment in a hospital versus self-treatment, finding a personal trainer or uh, trying the new fad diet and then not, as, uh, not sticking to it, not adhering it, and then uh, circling back around are high. And not only financial costs, but the psychological and emotional costs of feeling whether or not this is healthy, whether I am at a place that matches my ideal or not, those can take their toll as well and are far more difficult to quantify. So outside of the scope of this course, the, um, the effects are far-reaching, it's multifactorial. I'm approaching it from a physical thermodynamics type approach in this lecture. So let's look at incidence rates. Let's um, ignore McLean's and drill down into our own data. This is StatsCan, CanSim tables, the, uh, the most recent data when I made these tables was 2013, but I went and looked this morning. So the next slide includes data up until 2018, so we can compare. And this is just obese percentages in Canada and every individual province. So Canada overall is down here. You can see a general increase by a few percent over the course of 10 years from 13, or sorry, from 15% up to 18. And the average, um, is paralleled on both sides by individual provinces. Note, Newfoundland and Labrador leads the way in almost every year with the highest percent obesity or um, highest rate of obesity in Canada. And we are not doing much better. We are a contender for one of the top few spots. These are organized by 2013 data. So not generally encouraging. These are higher rates than we would like and they tend to be increasing up 10% in 10 years in Newfoundland. And uh, for comparison, Annie Ganesh, we'll see this uh, shortly, is around 27, 28%. If we look at the more recent data, and this table looks a bit more complicated, uh, I've included a breakdown, a stratification of 
weight across the top. So we have overweight individuals, obese individuals, diabetic individuals, and we have men and women across four different years, 2015 to 2018. What we're seeing more recently is that if we focus on obesity, because we just looked at that on the last slide, these are as high, if not somewhat higher. There's a general trend which is encouraging for at least uh, the rate of obesity to go down in men somewhat, while it's relatively consistent and stable in women. It's higher in men to begin with, so maybe it's normalizing. I'm not exactly sure why. But in both cases, we are higher than the national average in Nova Scotia, which is not great. And this seems to occur with, I'm not going to even say be related to at this point, but it seems to occur with uh, a higher incidence of diabetes as well. Local, provincial diabetes rates in the double digits where at the national level we're looking at 6 to 8 percent across the board. And variable over time, you can debate on whether it looks like it's going up or it's going down. Um, it's, it's not encouraging and we are still higher than the national average um, and higher in men than women. So this is the situation provincially. What does it look like locally? And while this is really current data, I couldn't find the corresponding current numbers for Antigonish proper. So this data is from 2010, 2011. It's a little bit older, which is why some of the numbers won't match up with the numbers on the last slides. But again, stratified by both overweight and obese, simply overweight or simply obese individuals. I'll just call, it, call your attention to the fact that in total, whether you're male or female, um, we have a higher incidence rate of obese individuals locally than at the provincial level than at the national level as well. So the, the trend is intact. We've introduced this trend and discussed it a few times. We tend to be in our pocket worse off than most people in the province who seem to be uh, worse off than people in the country as a whole. So worst, poor, not so great. Locally, we're not doing very well. And this, um, we parallel. This parallels uh, physical activity engagement, lower rates locally, lower fruit and vegetable intake, higher incidence of smoking, higher incidence of cardiovascular disease. This trend exists no matter which element that you're looking at. So doom and gloom, there is a case being made to study obesity and diabetes. We don't know if they're related at all at this point, but what I'd like to do quickly, not quickly, but what I would like to do next is jump ahead in your notes if you're looking on the, uh, the slides on Moodle to the, the last section and a half, last two sections at the end where we talk about the physiology of diabetes. We'll come back to the energy imbalance and measuring energy expenditure material in two weeks, just in time for your lab. But let's understand, if we can, the link between obesity and diabetes. Is there a link? what might potentially explain this link. And I have some really cool slides from uh, Dr. Kane's old PhD advisor, who uh, does a lot of work down at ECU in North Carolina on this very, uh, very topic. These are fantastic slides that aren't included in the posting online because they are proprietary and I got special permission from him to show them in class, but I'm not sharing and distributing them. They do a really nice job of highlighting some of the mechanisms. So let's talk about it. Diabetes, type 2 diabetes. A disease of lifestyle. What is the symptom or consequence of uh, developing diabetes over the course of your lifetime? Well, the hallmark symptom is a higher resting and a higher postprandial blood glucose and blood insulin response. That is... Blood glucose concentration in the body is consistently higher and jumps to a higher level after every meal. There's some disorder or inability of the normal systems in our body to regulate glucose. And even though we try by releasing insulin, which is the major storage hormone in the body, it's ineffective. Or maybe I'll frame it this way. It's less effective. 
And that degree of ineffectiveness changes. It becomes more effective. We can make it very ineffective if the disease, uh, the disease progresses too far. But the symptoms are elevated glucose and insulin. And the consequence of these symptoms is pretty bad. Glucose is actually fairly toxic. Left free in the bloodstream, it can damage uh, endothelial cells, which is why it can create uh, neuropathy in the eyes, the, the small vasculature in the eyes, why it damages um, some of the, epithel or the endothelium in um, small tissues in the foot. If blood flow isn't, uh, isn't uh, large and that supply isn't renewing as much, free glucose can damage tissues of the vasculature, leading to ulcers, leading to amputation if needed in really severe cases. So we want to store glucose. We try to store glucose by releasing insulin, but there's some underlying inability to do so. The underlying inability, the cause of diabetes, is not on this slide, at least in my opinion, and I'm, I'm hoping to convince you that uh, of that in this section. The cause of diabetes isn't excessive glucose intake. The cause of diabetes isn't higher circulating insulin. The cause, this, that's only what we observe. The cause is um, much more, I suppose, fundamental. So glucose and insulin in a cartoon, as shown here, is one thing, but you might have uh, seen traces like this presented in any personal health class or uh, nutrition class, where a normal, healthy individual will have, uh, will have um, a, a lower resting blood glucose that spikes after a meal that's quickly returned to normal as you store the glucose from that meal. A type 2 diabetic, on the other hand, sits higher on the scale at rest, they have a larger spike after a meal, and it is prolonged. It doesn't come down as quickly afterwards. So the obvious difference between these two traces is higher glucose, higher insulin, compromised response to a glucose challenge. And glucose challenge is really a meal. Anything that would add energy or add sugar to the system that needs to be dealt with or that needs to be stored. These are the symptoms that we're observing. It doesn't answer the question, what causes high blood glucose, high plasma insulin, and this compromised response? What causes the resistance to the normal signals in the body that deal with glucose um, in a healthy or normal situation? The causes are probably, have probably been built on and elaborated on a little bit since, um, since I was last involved in this area and made these slides, but in general we can break them down into two main theories. And these, um, these theories relate to the amount, quantity, and way that fat is stored within muscle. So this is related to not glucose, but fat in the diet. Lipotoxicity is a theory that states some kinds of fat that you ingest are not stored as easily as others, and if they are bad kinds of fat, they might interfere with normal enzyme function. And enzymes are proteins in the cells that do all of the work, and so if that work is compromised, we might uh, not respond to signals normally. Lipotoxicity says there's some interference by more reactive lipids, trans fats, saturated fats, things like that. The second theory, which I don't think is mutually exclusive, is one related to the mitochondria, that there is a metabolic backlog. We're trying to force more and more energy, more and more food stuff into the mitochondria, but they're not using that energy. And as a result, they become volatile or reactive. They um, exhibit dysfunction and they produce what I'm 
broadly going to refer to as free radicals. You might have heard about free radicals before, but these are molecules that have been modified. Usually they contain more electrons than they're supposed to, and they can damage other molecules in the cell. They're generally disruptive. We don't want to produce them, even though we do in a controlled way normally, but an excessive production of free radicals is generally bad and related to this mitochondrial dysfunction. So these are two theories. I kind of think that they are both true in some, uh, in some sense, or at least that they both uh, culminate or contribute to the production of diabetes together, and we'll see why in a second. And their theories, um, saying the word theories often will um, raise like critical red flags in a lot of people. Their theory is like the way that gravity is a theory, right? Every observation that we make says gravity exists and I stay on the ground. Even though we don't know what causes gravity, we can observe gravity and, and describe it. Gravity is a theory. Um, every observation that we make says it's true, but we don't know what the fundamental particle is or, or, or rule is that makes gravity happen. That said, we're not going to expect that we're going to fly off of the, uh, the planet in a, a couple days. We're pretty sure gravity works. We're pretty sure these theories work as well. So let's look at each of these in turn. Let me describe lipotoxicity in pictures. Now, this is somewhat complicated. It's meant, it's actually a very abbreviated version of the insulin signaling cascade. And you don't have to remember insulin receptor substrate or phosphatidyl inositol 3 kinase. You don't have to remember any of these intermediates. Just notice that when insulin is around, the cell, and this is a skeletal muscle cell, will receive that signal. Something happens. There's a cascade of events. That causes a transporter to move to the membrane to take up glucose. So the, uh, the sequence of events is when there is a, a challenge or a stress, the body releases insulin. It says, hey, I have energy that needs to be stored. Insulin is the thing that will get that done. Insulin goes to the tissues and says, knocks on the door and says, listen, there's glucose coming in. Can you open the doors and let it come in so it can be stored? And the doors are these GLUT4 or glucose transporter proteins. And I expect that this is not new. I expect that you've probably seen something like this before. The insulin signaling cascade is just a way that insulin says, okay, let's let glucose in. So in a normal situation, when this works properly, we have that quick increase in blood glucose that rapidly falls off. It increases, and then as we add more of these transports to the membrane, we can take it up and get it out of the blood. So this is the blood up top. This is inside the cell. After a meal, there's a lot of glucose and insulin in the blood. We want to get rid of it. Now, lipotoxicity says fat disrupts this normal situation. Fat gums up the gears in this uh, normal cascade of events. And when I say fat, I'm thinking of free fatty acids. Now, free fatty acids, you might have seen a picture of something that looks like this. One free fatty acid is one of these chains, right? This entire molecule is a triglyceride, triglyceride, three um, fatty acids bound to a glycerol backbone. And so fatty acids generally will move through the blood. Then when they're taken up, they're stored like this. That's the ultimate end goal. We want to make a triglyceride. So just so we're on the same page, free fatty acids are one of these strands. They are taken up and then stored as triglycerides. Now in a meal, you break down that fat, it circulates freely as free fatty acids, and we don't want that in the blood either. Luckily, on the muscle and other cells, we have transporters that will bring fat into the cell. When there's a lot of fat, these work pretty, uh, pretty hard. 
When it's brought into the cell, we tag it for storage. The CoA on the end is just the tag. It says, I've taken this fat up. Let's do something with it. The CoA allows the cell to work with it. And then in this form, it's pretty flexible on what happens next. We want it to be stored as triglyceride, which is this molecule on the right-hand side. This is the ideal. This is stable. It is non-reactive. It's inert. It gives us a source of energy for later. This is a lipid droplet. And we grow this little pool of, of fat in the cell that we could call on later if we wanted to. This is what we want to happen. What happens in practice is that this doesn't go right to triglycerides. TAG stands for triacylglycerol, by the way, if you're confused about that. Same thing, triglyceride, triacylglycerol, same thing. What will happen instead, in some cases, is instead of triglycerides, we'll make diglycerides. Instead of this molecule having three strands, we'll make a molecule with two strands. We can even make molecules with one strand. This drop is always in flux. You are adding fats, you are taking fats away. There's many different kinds of fats. And notice these are different shapes too. Some of these are different lengths. There is a ton of new information on how different species of fat interrupt this signaling cascade. We're not going to get into that though. And if it's not stored, we can also produce some things called ceramides in the cell, which are typically reactive. These are a byproduct of uh, metabolism gone wrong, we'll say. They're probably not gone wrong, but that's my, that's my, um, that's my quick and easy description. We'll just leave it there, I suppose, for now. So what I want you to get out of this is that there are a number of different fates. Some are better than others for fat that's taken up in the diet and then brought into the cell. Now, why is this bad? This is what should happen. Why is this bad? Well, we have evidence that if there is a lot of this free fatty acid CoA, this tagged fat in the cell, we can see it inhibit the ability of these enzymes to turn on. It blocks the insulin receptor. It blocks the next step. We've got empirical evidence to say that happens. Why else is it bad? Well, not only does this fat block proteins in the insulin cascade, diglycerides, they're not a stable form of storage, and these can insert themselves, they can block normal function of these proteins. Ceramides do the same thing. We have empirical evidence to say if there is more of this thing in the cell, these proteins are less active. What does that mean? If there's more of these intermediates, these fat intermediates in the cell, the insulin cascade is not turned on as high. It's blunted. It's turned down. It's less responsive. Insulin signal doesn't get through glucose isn't brought into the cell in as high a volume. We can start to see how this disruption could be a link between obesity and diabetes. If fat in the cell disrupts this pathway, that could mean that carrying excessive amounts of fat would disrupt the ability of the body to respond to insulin. Overall, less transport on the membrane, less uh, uptake of glucose. This is what we call lipotoxicity. So if this theory is true, do we observe this? Does this happen? Do we see more fat in the cell? Do we see higher fat in the blood? Is there a, a larger uptake? into the cell in obese or overweight individuals and or diabetic individuals? And the answer is yes. There is a stepwise progression in fat uptake, in fat storage, in the appearance of fat in the cell. 
that affects the ability of the cell to take up glucose. And this work was actually done while I was in my PhD at Guelph. It's been uh, improved on since then, but this was one of the, uh, the seminal studies in trying to ascertain how the muscle of lean, overweight, obese, and type 2 diet uh, sorry, type 2 diabetic individuals works and how it's different. This graph is showing you uptake. So if you'll um, indulge me for a second, I'll pop back to that last slide. <coughs> uptake is how much of this is happening. Free fatty acid being taken up into the cell. We're specifically measuring this arrow. There's not very much in lean, there's slightly more in overweight, and then as you become clinically obese and type 2 diabetic, massive movement of fat into the muscle. Movement of fat in doesn't mean that it's going to be there to disrupt insulin signaling. Maybe we get rid of it. If we measure the amount, the total amount of fat that's stored in that muscle, you can see we don't get rid of it. It's proportional to, and it parallels, the uptake rates. I purposely took off the labels on the sides here because they're rather complicated and I won't go, if you want, I can describe what the measurement is, but we don't really need to worry about that. Um, just that a higher bar means more uptake or a higher bar means there's more fat in the cell. A parallel uh, a content parallels uptake. So in an obese or a diabetic individual, they tend to take up more fat into the cell and they tend to also store more fat in the cell. Well, storing more fat in the cell, okay, that could be bad. What if we use it though? Usually, if you stress the body, it responds. Right? If you exercise, you go for a jog, that gets easier for you over time. What if this is a stress, and what if the body responds to it? What if the body can use this fat? Well, it uses it in the mitochondria, powerhouse of the cell. I think Dan Kane's trademark that. If it weren't a problem to store all that excess fat, we would expect that stress, maybe it would bring about a higher oxidation of fat in the muscle. That makes sense. It's a stress. The body adapts. But when we look at the muscle as a whole, we don't see a higher oxidation. We don't even see similar oxidation. We, in fact, see that oxidation or disposal of that fat is reduced. So... I like the analogy of, of a kitchen sink. You've got the faucet, you've got the drain plug, and then the sink that you're collecting water in. And you can turn the faucet on to full blast. Let's say that's um, poor eating habits. You're eating a lot of food, trying to fill the sink up. If the sink is the muscle in this instance, the drain is the mitochondria. The drain is disposing of that extra energy. You can unplug the drain completely try to get that water running through so it doesn't fill up. Filling up is bad in this scenario. What this is saying is that in a situation where the tap's on full blast, not only do we, do we not have the, uh, the plug out, but the plug is in fact in. It's holding more water in than normal. There's less fat being disposed of in these obese individuals than a lean individual making the situation worse. Interestingly, this looks at the entire muscle, but if you break it down to pound for pound mitochondria, you take out one or two or 10 mitochondria out of this muscle, and then you look at their individual ability to use fat, they still work. They still work. The mitochondria that are there work just as well as lean individuals. Maybe, it's not statistical, but there's a trend upwards where maybe this is even like a response to the stress of having more fat on hand. Maybe they're starting to work a bit better. I don't know. 
What this is saying is that the problem with disposal is that obese individuals have fewer mitochondria. As a whole, the muscle does a, a poor job of disposing of fat, but it's not because the mitochondria are deficient. They work just as well as lean mitochondria. There's just less of them. And that makes sense, right? As you train in running, that becomes easier, largely because you proliferate mitochondria. As you train in bed rest and a sedentary lifestyle, you don't need those mitochondria. They go away. They're hard to keep up. Fewer mitochondria. So I'll summarize for you the uh, lipotoxicity in a little schematic. This is what we think happens, and I'm not showing you all of the work, but it's important to realize that a lot like the glucose transporters moved, there are also fat transporters that move. That was also work done by this, uh, this same lab. And so in a normal situation, this is very similar to what, uh, what I showed you with fatty acids in the blood. They're taken up by a muscle cell. They're stored or they're oxidized or they might make disruptive intermediates. In response to more fat, these transporters move to the membrane and allow more to be taken in. Where this becomes a problem is in obesity and diabetes, there's persistent higher intake of fat and intake of energy. So there's always a signal to take up fat from the blood into the muscle. We move a lot of these transporters from inside the cell where they're not active to the membrane where they're always bringing in fat. That explains the higher uptake rates in obese individuals. And then the mitochondria are fewer. Even though they have normal function, the volume is reduced. And that's not obvious in this cartoon, but imagine that this spiky circle is smaller on the right-hand side. Normal function, but they have a reduced volume, which ultimately uh, means the sink is plugged, the faucet's on, there's more fat being stored, more fat that can impair the normal workings of the cell. This makes sense. Oversupply, under demand, accumulation or accrual, which, if that's bad, will interrupt insulin signal. 